Welcome to Age of Sigmar Strategy Academy. In this episode, I'll be discussing the Osiarch Bone Reapers. I'll be going over their lore, rules, and how to best use them in-game. The story of this army all starts with Nagash, the god of death, and his primary goal in his eternal unlife, to use his power to become the supreme ruler of the entirety of the mortal realms. It really is only a small thing to ask for, after all. While he has many armies under his command to work with already to accomplish this goal, each of them have their own problems that make them unfit for the job. The vampire lords of Soulblight Grave Lords often get distracted by their own ambitions if unattended. The Night Haunt are deadly but a bit too wild for complex tactics, and the Flesh Eater Courts are just straight up insane. In the end, it's obvious none of these armies are going to be reliable for taking over the realms in his name. So he and his first Mortark, Arcan, came together to work on a new force, which lacked the flaws of his existing forces, but had the power to grow his vast empire. And, after countless generations of planning and work, they created the Osiric Bone Reapers. Unlike most forms of death magic in the mortal realms, where dead creatures are simply given unlife, the Osiric Bone Reapers are specially crafted from the bones of multiple corpses, to be molded into finely crafted warriors and war machines. But of course, to do so would require a nice steady income of bones to work with. So the legions of this army will go from civilization to civilization and propose a deal. Either give us your monthly bone taxes, or be annihilated and we will forcibly take the bones from your body. Often outmatched by the impenetrable ranks of the Osiarch legions, they oblige and pay the tithe. Although, these taxes are often high enough where, for some civilizations, this means that the citizens are brought in as sacrifices once they reach a certain age, or are randomly selected. For others, it means that the society is built upon luring in travelers to be murdered and then later harvested. In the end, the Osiarch Bone Reapers do not care how their quotas are met. As long as they get their tithe, they have no reason to further meddle with the lesser mortals under their control. The system they have in place is renowned and feared for its macabre efficiency of resources, and their cold, calculated plans constructed by their mighty generals have all but ensured that there will always be more bones to reap for the Osiarch Bone Reapers. In game, all of this is represented rather well. While you get a handful of minor bonuses that don't do a ton on their own, like a 6-up ward, exploding 6s to hit, and being immune to battle shock. The rule Relentless Discipline allows you to feel like a true tactician, giving you cumulative bonus command points based on how many units you have on the table. Oftentimes, you will start the game with 8 or 9 command points, which is more than some armies will gain in an entire game. So it goes without saying, you will be spoiled for tactical choices, and proper use of these command points are what separate the good from the bad Osiark players. Much like in the lore, you're going to have to make sure that your resources are well spent if you want to keep your army functioning like a well-oiled machine. But on top of the regular commands that are in the core rules, you can spend your giant pile of command points on faction-specific command abilities, some of which appear on the war scrolls of specific units, but most appear on the list I'm about to mention. The most important part of these is that, unlike most commands, these can be issued multiple times in a phase, to different units, rather than just once. Starting off strong, we have Reform Ranks, which is used in the movement phase and allows unit to retreat and charge. Retreat and charge is just insanely powerful and allows your army to never really get bogged down in a combat that they don't want to be in, which is a privilege that most armies just don't have. Unstoppable Advance gives a unit plus three to a normal move. While pretty boring, it's powerful. Running a unit is usually still better for just getting where you need to go, but for getting your key hammer units into combat, it's great. And for the command you'll probably be using the most, Impenetrable Ranks gives you plus one to your faction 6-up ward rolls. You can mostly think of this as a side grade to all-out defense. Also, this can be used in any phase you are attacked, not just combat and shooting, which gives it a bit of a reactive advantage over all-out defense. For more offensive damage, you have Bludgeon, which gives you an extra bit of rend. It's always nice to have this in your arsenal for chewing through high-armored targets. We also have Renit Constructs, which gives some minor healing, which is usually best used if one of your centerpiece models gets extremely damaged. 
unflinching coordination allows a friendly unit to fight immediately after one of your heroes. But it is a bit clunky due to the friendly unit having to have received the command, preventing you from using any of your other amazing commands on them in the same phase. And Counter-Strike gives a friendly unit that got charged plus one to wound in the following combat phase. Besides the last two being a bit niche, all of the rest I regularly use in pretty much every game I play with this army. And the flexibility they bring is really what sets this army apart from the rest. So while you do have a lot of command points to work with, as previously mentioned, it's important to spend them well if you want to lead your army to victory. You don't want to be too overzealous and run out of command points at the wrong time, but you also don't want to end your turn with unused points. Moving on, if you are to start your own legion of tax collectors, it's important to go over the sub-factions. It should be noted that these sub-factions aren't very transformative to list building, as they don't unlock any battle line. So, some army lists could completely shift subfaction without much issue. Honestly, a lot of the subfactions come down to a personal preference sort of thing, and what kind of buff you'd like your army to have. First, we have what is probably the strongest subfaction, Mortis Praetorians. It allows you to, once a turn, when an enemy unit charges, you can also attempt to charge with a nearby friendly unit. This is great mostly because it means your opponent is going to have a hard time picking their fights since if you charge a unit at a unit that just charged, it's going to be in combat with something it probably didn't want to be fighting. Additionally, you don't even have to charge at a unit that just charged. It's often beneficial to try and go after some other unit that didn't even want to get in combat in the first place. As a general rule of thumb in Age of Sigmar, moving at times when you otherwise shouldn't be moving is just powerful, and the subfaction does this very well. Lastly, most of the named characters do have the Mortis Praetorian keyword, so this is the only subfaction that they actually benefit from. Petrifix Elite is aptly named as it gives a bonus to your more elite troops, those being your Immortus Guard, Necropolis Stalkers, Morgasts, and the Gothazar Harvester. The subfaction originally debuffed enemy melee attacks with minus one damage, but got fairly nerfed to now give minus one to wound rolls. Even with the nerf, it's still a solid bonus to have if you like running more elite troops. Going with an ivory host army means that your natterite weapons generate another bonus attack if you took any damage earlier in the turn. This can be accomplished a few ways, like getting unleashed held, or getting attacked earlier in the combat phase before you attack. Also, if you got lucky and have damned terrain in your starting territory, you'll definitely want to make use of it. This subfaction is good, but sometimes a bit hard to make work with the timing of its ability. Stalyark Lords gives free reroll charge rolls to your mounted units, so obviously this must be the subfaction you'd take if you want to bring lots of cavalry, right? No, not at all actually, because the faction ability just isn't good. And if you want to play into the high movement play style of your cavalry units, you're just better off playing Mortis Praetorians. Simply put, don't use this subfaction. Null Myriad is the subfaction you play if you really want to piss off a fifth of your opponents, as while your units are wholly within 9 inches of your Null Myriad wizards, they get a 2-up spell ignore, which basically means if you have your army huddled up, you are all but immune to spells. Now of course, this subfaction does literally nothing against some armies, as they might not even have any wizards, or in the case of most armies, they will have spells, but they're spells that they use to buff their own units. What this does best against are armies that rely heavily on magic for their damage and debuff output, like Zinch, Starborn Seraphon, Lumineth, and some Sylvaneth armies. The other issue is that keeping your stuff wholly within 9 inches of your wizard heroes can be a bit of a tall order, as that's a really small aura to work with, and some units in this army move much faster than your foot wizards. Normally, I'd say it's just better to ignore the subfaction, as most of the time, subfactions that give some weird matchup dependent techie ability are never worth considering. You can look at the subfaction's Winter Bite for Ogre Maw Tribes or Winter Leaf for Sylvaneth if you want some prime examples of this. But unlike most tech options, this is actually extremely powerful and consistent into things it's trying to counter, given the effect happens on a 2-up. Additionally, we are in a matched play season that focuses heavily on wizards, and a lot of the endless spells and spells in the lore of Primal Frost are extremely powerful, to a point where they will be used, 
so it's actually a decent subfaction, albeit extremely meta-dependent. Lastly, we have Crematorians, which makes your models do damage when they die based on their wounds characteristic. So because of the fact that this army doesn't have a ton of wounds, it means that you aren't going to be doing a ton of damage with this. But the chip damage isn't awful. It's a neat little minor buff in a similar style to Ivory Host. And I'd probably place this competitively right under that subfaction. Now, on to the many units that make up this army. When talking about building an army for Osiarch Bone Reapers, it is impossible not to bring up the two Mortarks that this army has access to. Arcan the Black, Mortark of Sacrament, and Catacros, Mortark of the Necropolis. They both just amplify the rest of your army's power in such a way that it means that it's often extremely unoptimal to not at least bring one of them. Each of them have the ability to, in your hero phase, pick three different friendly units, and either heal or regenerate models to a unit. This ability alone can easily heal and bring back 200 points or more worth of models over the course of a game, making your already durable army just that much more resilient. Further differences, Arcan is the best wizard in the army, able to cast three spells a turn at plus two to cast, and knows all of the spells in the lore of Ossian sorcery. Already, that would make him a scary caster, but additionally, his signature ability adds 6 inches to the range of spells cast by friendly death wizards wholly within 18 inches. And that's for any and all spells, not just those in the lore, which opens up a ton of options. Most notably, it means you can hit your opponent with debuff and damage spells from your territory on the first turn, which normally would be impossible outside of some really weird combos. But overall, it just makes casting for your army just that much more flexible whether it's casting endless spells, or even just your run-of-the-mill mystic shield. Arcan is also one of the fastest units in the game with a base movement of 16 inches, which is best used for positional advantage or possibly move-blocking your opponents so they can't redeploy away from your big damage-dealing units. But just don't use the movement to get into combat with anything that's not a frail screen unit, as he does almost no damage. And for his War Scroll spell, it does mortal wounds based on how lucky you are with your dice rolls. It's extremely swingy damage-wise, and will usually do almost no damage, or a bunch of damage. But to a unit with 15 wounds total, on average, it will do about 4 mortal wounds. And for Catacros, he is the commander of the army. Instead of focusing on spells like Arcan, his bonuses are more direct buffs and debuffs. And boy does Catacros do a lot in this department. He can issue a command for free once per turn, and has two command abilities on his war scroll that both are used in the hero phase. If he's more than three inches away from enemy units, his command can give all OCR units within range plus one to hit rolls and plus one to save rolls. This basically means your whole army has all at attack and all at defense on them at all times, which is just stupidly powerful and why he's just such a popular choice. He also has a different command to give a unit plus one to its attacks characteristic, but this is usually a much worse option to do. Catacros is also accompanied by his retinue. His spy master makes it so that once per turn your opponent might lose a command point they gained. The scroll bearer just picks an enemy unit anywhere on the battlefield, and they have minus one to hit rolls on their attacks. No rolling required for this ability. And unlike Arcan, Catacros is no slouch in combat and fights at his strongest profile when he is by an enemy hero. Just make sure he doesn't get stuck in combat by the time your next hero phase rolls around. You don't want to be locked out of using your best command ability. Overall, both Mortarks are extremely impressive on the table. So much so, I'd go as far to say that bringing one of them is the best way to start writing a list for the army. Furthermore, there have even been multiple successful lists that run both. But it does limit the options for the rest of your army as that's a lot of points wrapped up in just two models. For your small wizard heroes, you actually have a ton of options, and in general, they all fill the same role of support hero. The differences being that the Bone Shaper can heal or resurrect units exactly how Arcan or Catacros can, but can only pick one unit within 6 inches instead of three units within 24 inches. The Aus Effector buffs your Crawlers, Harvesters, and most importantly your Morgasts, the Soul Reaper sacrifices some utility for better melee attacks, which immediately means it's the worst choice, since it's still a frail support hero that you wouldn't want to have in combat. 
Vakmortian is a double caster and knows the entire lore. Coolest thing about him is that he debuffs enemy units that are wholly within 12 to have minus 2 to their bravery, which is a pretty brutal debuff against armies that are sensitive to battle shock, since this army can shut off inspiring presence with a couple different effects. And lastly, we have the Soul Mason, who also knows the entire spell lore, and on top of casting two spells, can cast its War Scroll spell for free at the end of the hero phase. Its spell gives plus one to wound rolls for the attacks of a friendly Mortec Guard or Cavalos Death Rider unit, which is fine. Big downside for this guy is the chair he is sitting on technically is a mount, so he doesn't actually benefit from the Lookout Sir rule that prevents him from being shot if the enemy is more than 12 inches away, so he is sensitive to shooting. By no means is he bad, since three spells a turn is good, but he is the most expensive foot hero, and the kind of list he fits in is a little niche. But overall, besides the Soul Reaper, each of these have their own unique use case, and could slot into a competitively viable list. For the lore of Ossian sorcery that the previously mentioned wizards get access to, there are six spells, but only three I could see someone taking with their spell or enhancement. The other three are good, but a bit too situation specific, and realistically will only be cast by one of your three heroes who know the entire spell lore. Empower Natterite weapons makes your bonus attacks happen on fives and sixes to hit rather than just sixes on a friendly unit. But this doesn't synergize with Ivory Host, because Games Workshop hates fun for whatever reason. Drain Vitality is a debuff that gives an enemy unit minus one to hit for their attacks, and minus one to their save characteristic. This is probably just the best spell right here. It's such a crippling debuff that no army wants to deal with. Well, except maybe Nighthaunt, they probably don't really care. And Mortal Contract debuffs an enemy unit for the entire game, so that they take more damage at the end of every phase in which the unit took damage. Neat. Back to heroes, the Liege Cavalos is your cavalry hero and it can issue a command for free once per turn, which you'll probably be using to issue the command on its war scroll to give a friendly unit plus one to its attacks characteristic. Overall, this is just a solid unit, and pretty much anything in the army can make use of the extra attack buff. The main reason why you wouldn't want to bring this unit is because they don't unlock any battle line options, unlike your Mortis and Heroes, which can make list building feel of tight at times, since he isn't very cheap for a support hero either. There is also a named version of this dude, Arc Cavalos Xantos, who's just like the Liege but has better damage, and his command gives a bubble of plus one to wound rolls for Mortis Praetorian units within range. He has a pretty good home in Mortis Praetorians, as with its command and Catacros's command, you can give most of your army plus one to hit and plus one to wound rolls. Doesn't get much better than that. Before we get to the non-hero units of this army, it's important to talk about what enhancements are best used on the heroes we just talked about. For command traits, I'd argue that Osiark Bone Reapers have some of the best options in the entire game. Dark Acolyte makes your first spell cast from the lore of Ossian Sorcery unable to be unbound. Always nice to not have your spells stopped. This is particularly powerful in the current General's Handbook, as there's a whole battle tactic for successfully casting a spell and not having it be unbound. Show of superiority makes it so your opponent sometimes has to spend two command points instead of one when issuing a command, and Mighty Arcosian is pretty cool to have on a Liege Cavalos, with the artifact that adds one to ward rolls, so you can have an extremely tanky general. With some buffs, you could easily get the Liege Cavalos to a two-up save, ignoring rend, with a four-up ward. Some armies just do not have the tools to kill that. And for my personal two favorite command abilities we have, Diversionary Tactics makes it so that enemies within 12 inches have minus three to their charge rolls, and Aura of Sterility, which makes units wholly within 12 inches, minus one to be hit and wound from shooting. Both of these are just stupidly strong against the right armies, to an almost toxic level. It's kind of insane how good they can be. For which one out of the two I mentioned that you'd want to have in your army, it kind of just depends on personal taste. Do you want to screw over melee armies or shooting armies? 
for artifacts for this army, I mostly think of it like a flowchart. If you're bringing a bone shaper, you take the artisan's key for even more model regeneration. If not, and you have an os effector, you probably take the Gothazar cartouche for an aura of plus one to wound. And if not, you take load of saturation or arcane tome on a liege Cavalos. You will most likely have at least one of those heroes in your list, but if for whatever reason you don't, uh, you can pretty much take whatever artifact you like the look of. It kind of doesn't matter. Also, just for kicks, I just wanted to take a moment to highlight what is probably one of the most laughably bad artifacts I've seen in a long time. Bones of the Abyss. So, this can only be used on a Soul Mason, and for every spell he casts, he gets an increase to the attack's characteristic of the chair he rides around by one. The thing is, is that his chair attacks are terrible. Literally, the best case scenario for this guy is in the current season, you have him cast two spells normally, then another free spell if you bring Chronomatic Cogs, and then another free spell if you're going second, thanks to the season's special realm rule, and then at the end of the turn, if you roll good for his ability, you're able to cast Soul Guide three times, for a total of seven casts. And even if you do all of that, you bring his damage against a 4-up save from 2 damage to 4 damage. That's nothing. This, that literally does nothing. I will never understand why artifacts like this ever get written. Even if his chair did have decent attacks, you'd probably never want this guy in combat because he's a squishy support hero who will die to basically anything. Ugh, GW, why do you do this to us? I, I'll never get it. Getting back on track, for the most part, OBR armies don't really need extra artifacts that badly, especially since most lists have a named character or two. So it's usually unnecessary to take a Warlord or Command Entourage Battalion to get another. Controlling turn order or going with one of the seasonal battalions is often the better choice for list building. Alright, and now on to troops. First, we have your basic foot troop, Mortec Guard. They're slow and have okay-ish attacks, but importantly, they have their own OCR command, Shield Wall. This makes it so that in the combat phase, their save can't be modified. This is best used when getting attacked by units with Rend 2 or better, since otherwise you're just better adding one to your ward rolls. Mortec Guard are decent, they aren't as much of the bread and butter unit that they used to be, where you'd bring them in every list. They aren't necessarily useless, since a unit of 10 is the cheapest screen the army has access to, and a unit of 20 or more does require more dedicated damage to take down. But oftentimes, a lot of the other options in the army are going to be more impressive. They probably need a slight points decrease, or for their support pieces to get better to truly shine. And for the other non-conditional battle line choice for the army, we have Cavalos Death Riders, which are pretty fast for an army as slow as OBR and have the highest wounds to point ratio in the army, making them an annoying unit for the opponent to deal with. And to top things off, they do mortal wounds when they charge, which is just another reason why they're good in Mortis Praetorians. Also, as much as it is visually unpleasing, it's often beneficial to keep your Cavalos Death Riders sideways, as it really extends the amount of area they're able to block, rather than having them face forward. With the current coherency rules, you can have each Death Rider on its side long ways, and just under an inch in between each model, giving you a wall to block your opponent's movement that's around 15 inches long. One extra thing that makes them exceptionally good is that this army has a battle tactic where you need to charge with a Death Rider unit and have it stand combat until the end of the turn, which is pretty easy to do given that they don't do that much damage, but are durable and can take a decent punch. Don't forget, in the current season, battle tactics are rather difficult to do, so having more to work with is nice. Overall, they're a staple unit that can be put in most lists. Having one in a list is nice for its screening, lane blocking, speed, and durability per point. But if you really like them, you can run multiple units to really clog up the board and make your opponent's life difficult. Moving on to the elite troops of this army, we have Necropolis Stalkers, which are your brawler unit. They're pretty durable and slow, but pack a punch. Their main thing is at the start of the combat phase, you can pick one of four bonuses to gain for that phase. You can either add one to your hits, wounds, saves, or damage. 
In 99% of cases, you will be doing the damage or save bonus, though. They also have a command ability that allows them to run and charge and fly over terrain, which is mostly just used to get over terrain as it's less consistent than just adding 3 to your movement with unstoppable advance. The other models that can be built with the same kit as Stalkers are the Immortus Guard, who have a natural 3-up save, act as a bodyguard for your heroes, and they have a command that allows them to fight twice in the combat phase once a game. These are especially good for keeping pretty much any of your heroes alive. So unless your list really just doesn't have the room, you will probably want a unit of these. The absolute best thing about both of these units is that they're the models with the highest wounds characteristic in the army that can still be consistently revived. And reviving one of them gives you the best value on a per point basis, which is why you'll often see both of these run in plenty of lists. For my personal favorite unit in the army, we have Morgast Archai and Morgast Harbingers, which are like stalkers but trade some durability for mobility and utility. Both kinds of Morgast are rather fast, can fly, do solid damage, stop enemies from receiving and issuing commands within 3 inches, and if they roll an 8 or higher when charging, they get the strike first effect. The difference between the two kinds of Morgasts being that Archai get a 5-up ward when wholly within 12 inches of a friendly hero, and Harbingers get the ability to deep strike. Although a 5-up ward is so much better to have on an elite melee unit, so you always take Archai over the Harbingers. Harbingers also have anti-synergy with your army rules, as if they are in reserve, they won't count as units on the board for your relentless discipline. If the Morgast Harbingers become significantly cheaper than Archai, I could maybe see a place for them, since otherwise the army doesn't have access to Deep Strike. But for this discussion, I'll be covering Morgast Archai with Halberds, since that's the best way to use them in my opinion. The role that Morgasts fill is that they're your mobile hammer unit, since they're tied for your fastest troop, and do some real nasty melee damage on top of that. Specifically, they're great for taking down well-armored foes, since they have Rend 2 attacks base with their Halberds, which can be brought to Rend 3 if you bring a Mortis and Oss effector, and with Bludgeon that brings the attacks to Rend 4. Furthermore, whatever you throw these at will usually want to get all at defense to mitigate some of that Rend, but because they turn off commands, this is impossible, so their attacks can effectively get to Rend 5, which is easily enough to take down any armored enemy. And the utility of shutting down commands is incredibly powerful into armies with faction-specific command abilities, like Fire Slayers, Flesh Eater Courts, or even other Osiric Bone Reapers armies. But this unit can be a bit frail compared to your other units on a per-point basis, so you'll pretty much have to make sure that they're always within 12 of Friendly Hero for that 5-up ward. It is important to note that you can't improve the 5-up ward with Impenetrable Ranks, since that only improves the faction-specific ward not any ward. And their most crippling downside is that unlike every other troop in the army, there's no consistent way to bring back models to their unit outside of Rally. Almost all of the regeneration in the army is capped at bringing back models with a wounds characteristic of 5 or less, and they have 6 wounds. If you want the utility of them in your list, a unit of 2 is great, and a unit of 4 will delete almost any non-horde unit in the game in one swing. But if your list focuses extremely heavily on model regeneration, you're probably better off with bringing Stalkers as a main hammer unit. Now for the faction's artillery unit, the Mortec Crawler. It's a shooting unit with three different ammunition types that the Catapult can shoot, each with a different range, and in general, the shorter the range of the attack, the better the damage output. But damage isn't really what this thing's job is. Its damage output is actually extremely underwhelming. Rather, its main ability is what you take it for. After it shoots, for each unit it shot at, roll a die. On a 5-up, the unit gets the strike last effect until your next hero phase. Additionally, if you put all of your attacks into a single target, the effect happens on a 3-up instead. The strike's last effect can be pretty crippling on an enemy unit. Whether you're using it offensively so you can later dogpile an enemy unit with multiple of your own units in the next combat, or if you want to use it defensively on an enemy unit you know will want to charge you next turn, so that you can cripple their damage potential later. Although, currently, the unit does suffer a bit from a points issue since it's a bit expensive for a unit that only does one thing, and that ability does have a chance to fail. 
and do basically nothing for a whole battle round. However, being overpointed by a little bit is probably the best issue a unit can have, since all it really takes for it to be a solid staple in OBR lists is just to come down maybe 20-30 points or so. If I were to use it in my army, I'd only want to bring one, as bringing two means that you'll have 400 points just sitting in your back lines, doing almost zero damage, which is just too much of a liability. Overall, not an awful unit though, it has a role and it does it decently well. Now, if we're talking units that just don't fill their role, we would be talking about the Goth Czar Harvester. Its main ability is that it can regenerate models, and this ability is usually best paired with Mortet Guard, just due to the way it works. It originally gave some pretty solid model regeneration when your models would die, regardless of when they died. However, it was nerfed extremely heavily, so it only restores about half the Mortet Guard slain in the combat phase, at the end of the combat phase. So if you decided to use a block of 20 Mortet Guard, supported by a Goth Czar Harvester, and the majority of the guard die before the combat phase even rolls around, then it's not really going to be doing a ton. Even if the guard don't die before the combat phase, it's still easily possible for the opponent to just outright kill the whole block of 20 before the end of the phase, especially if they have a way to stop commands like roaring with a monster. Overall, the Harvester isn't the worst unit in the world, since it's currently cheaper than most units in the army at 180 points. It is a monster, and its damage output isn't too bad, but there's no way this unit is the optimal choice with its current rules. So as of recording, the OCR Cabone Reapers Battle Tome is rather new, and they got some major points changes with the battle scroll that came out a couple weeks ago. So data is still a bit fuzzy, but I'll be sharing a few lists that either did well, or are slightly modified from well-performing lists. This is what I'd call the Tacticians list, where it's all about positioning and punishing your opponent hard for trying to challenge your castle. Catacross and the Bone Shaper with the Artisan's Key will give your opponent a really hard time with how well you can regenerate your models. You have some solid board control with all of your Death Riders, and the fact that the army is in Mortis Praetorians. Also, the Immortus Guard and Necropolis Stalkers act as a nice counterpunch unit if anything gets close enough to you. And most of your army will have plus one to wound and plus one to hit rolls thanks to Catacross and Xantos. For the most part, competitive lists have focused on a lot of the units listed here, due to their effectiveness and regenerative capabilities. But if you want something more wizard-oriented, we have this Null Myriad list, featuring Arcan, an Oss Effector, and Bone Shaper. With the Null Myriad ability and Arcan's plus two to unbind, your opponent's going to have a difficult time with their own spells. Also, the two big damage-dealing units of Immortus Guard and Necropolis Stalkers will do some real work when backed up by the two units of Morgast Archai. And even though I didn't really cover them, this list brought one of this faction's endless spells, the Nightmare Predator, for a bit of ranged damage output. Endless spells are actually a great way to fill up the remaining points for an OBR list, as when most of your units cost around 200 points or more, you can end up with some awkward point totals that these help alleviate. If you like magic and hate enemy magic, this is the kind of list for you. And for a more off-meta option, a skilled player went 4-0 with this list that actually went down in points later after a recent change, meaning it has 100 points left over to work with. The most obvious change would probably be to swap out Arcan for Catacross, and admittedly that's probably the best change you could do for this list, but with a little ingenuity you could swap things around to get a decent mixed arms list. If you're the kind of person that just wants to run a bit of everything, and maybe you bought the Vanguard box, this is probably what I'd do, just for learning the army. Admittedly, this probably isn't the strongest option, but it's still good enough where you could still have solid games with it. And those are the solid example lists I had to share. I wouldn't call any of them the be-all, end-all list for OCR Capone Reapers, but they should make a good jumping-off point for writing your own lists. Now for the section where I go over some tips I couldn't really fit anywhere else in the video. OBR tip number one, how should you use your command points? It definitely takes some getting used to, especially if you're a new player, just having this giant pile of command points and a million options for what to do with them. But honestly, it's not too different from using your regular amounts of command points. You just have more choices. How I usually go about thinking about my command point usage 
is I'll iteratively go over the battle round, first thinking about what commands I'll need to use, what commands I'd like to use, and then, if I still have points left over, what are some commands that would give me a minor benefit. Let's use that ivory host list as an example and say that we're partway through a game against a mostly melee-oriented army like uh, Slaves to Darkness, and my main goal is to destroy a big enemy hammer unit with my Morghast Archai. I'm taking the first turn, and my general is still alive, but I only have six units on the table, so in the battle round I'll have six command points to work with. And I still have a liege Cavalos on the field, and he issues a command for free each turn. And there's two turns in a battle round, so I'll know I have effectively eight command points to work with total. Now usually, the most important commands are the one that help you complete your battle tactic, help you get into combat, protect you from damage in your opponent's turn, or increase your own damage output in your own turn. So let's focus on those first. At the start of the round, I'll be using my Liege Cavlos' command to give plus one attacks to the Morgasts, since why else would I be bringing a Liege Cavalos? It's one of his main things. I know on my turn I should probably save a command point in case I need to reroll a charge, and either use bludgeon or all-out attack once they get into their target. So in my turn, I'll probably need to use 3 CP. Then, on my opponent's turn, I should expect a bit of a hit back, so I'll need a couple command points for defensive-oriented commands, like all-out defense or impenetrable ranks. So I'll know I need to spend 2 CP on that turn. Now I have 3 left I'll need to spend, so I should start considering my less necessary options that still make my life a bit easier. Admittedly, being a bit faster would be nice. Maybe I want to ensure my Morgasts end exactly 3 inches away from the optimal target after they normal move, rather than something like 5 inches away. That way, if they end up redeploying away and get a lucky roll of a 6, I only need to make a 9 inch charge, rather than a near impossible 11 inch charge. Or I just want to run something forward automatically 6 inches since I know I'll want it to keep up with the Morghasts for future turns. So, at least one of those choices will cost me one. And, like I said before, I know I'm going to get charged in the following turn, and I think at least something in my army will have a decent chance to survive the initial hit. So, using an offensive command on my opponent's turn, like Counter-Strike, wouldn't hurt since it doesn't stop me from using the previously mentioned defensive commands. After that, I only have one command point left that I can spend on really anything that is nice to have, but isn't that important. Let's just say maybe one of my units took a decent amount of damage, so I should probably use Renit Constructs or Rally. This won't do a ton, but it could make the difference in the end. Like I said before, it's important you use every command you can. Obviously, this is Age of Sigmar. It's too deep to know exactly what you should be doing 100% of the time every battle round, and dice rolls can have a big impact on what you end up doing. But you should have a general idea in mind on each of your turns, that way you don't end up wasting commands on stuff you don't need, or wasting them because you have some left over at the end of the battle round. OBR tip number two. So you know how the Immortus Guard can protect the heroes of this army? Well, sometimes this can actually be a direct downside for the Osiarch Bone Reaper player if they aren't careful. This is because unlike most effects that are colloquially known as bodyguard effects have the wording can roll a dice, meaning that the effect is optional. However, the bodyguard rule for Immortus Guard does not have this wording and just tells you to roll a dice whenever a nearby hero takes damage, meaning it's not optional. So because of the fact that many of the heroes in this army are rather frail, especially in the Mortisons, if the opponent decided to dump a ton of damage into a Mortison, while they're next to your Mortis Guard, they would only have to get through a 4-up save of the hero rather than the bulky 3-up save of the Immortus Guard. And the Bodyguard effect is very consistent, happening on a 2-up, so those Immortus Guard will be taking the brunt of the damage. Therefore, if you ever are playing against Osiarch Bone Reapers, definitely keep this in mind if the opportunity arises and it's beneficial to do so. Now, not all hope is lost as an OBR player as you have options to play around this if your opponent has the means to put a lot of damage into your frail heroes. The best thing you can do is position your hero and the unit like this, so that only one of your Immortus Guard is within 3 inches of the hero for the ability, 
That way, if the opponent does try to dump a ton of damage into the hero, you can allocate the damage into the closest Immortus Guard and have it die. And then, because after it dies, there will no longer be any damage going into the guard. The reason that this works is because wounds are allocated one at a time in Age of Sigmar. Now, it will still hurt to lose your hero, but in many cases it's better to lose a hero than an entire six-man squad of guard. The other beneficial thing about this is you don't actually have to take away the closest guard model, so you can still keep the very good protection that you had before. Doing this just gives you some nice flexibility in case the situation does arise. OBR Tip 3 I haven't mentioned it yet, but this army does have faction terrain, and it throws out some solid debuffs here and there, but that's about it for its effect. One big, initially inconspicuous effect of it is that it's the faction terrain with the biggest footprint for just one piece of terrain. And it's impassable, meaning that units can't end a move on it, and only flying units can move over it. So, when beneficial, you'll want to place the terrain in a way that it can act as another screen in your army, to protect your important units and stop the opponent from what they want to do. This can be difficult to do, since it is just absurdly large, and you may be forced to put it in a non-optimal position, but it's something you'll want to keep in mind, especially if you're the person setting up the board. OBR Tip 4. If you haven't noticed yet, basically half the abilities in this army either heal or returns models to damaged units. Meaning, when built correctly, this army can have the best model regeneration in the game, hands down. If you're fighting OBR and plan on risking your own units to do damage to the enemy, make sure you actually do something meaningful. You don't want to lose your strongest hammer units, and your opponent just undoes the damage they did in just a couple rounds. This can be difficult to do since some armies just don't have the tools to fully dismantle OBR, but in cases like this it means you just mostly have to focus on objective control and doing battle tactics. After all, killing the enemy doesn't win games. Points do. And that's pretty much all I have to say about the Osiarch Bone Reapers. I hope if you're a soon-to-be Osiarch player that you got something out of the video, whether it's gameplay knowledge or the newfound desire to collect a large pile of bones. Videos like this are possible thanks to viewers like you, and the support from Patreon. Special thanks to Travis Keltner. The extra support means a lot to me. If you want to become a cool Patreon member like them, check out the video description to a link to my Patreon page. Also, if you're watching this video within a week of its release, I have a poll currently running for what army I should cover next in the series, Gloomspite Gits or Ogre Maw Tribes. A link to that poll will also be in the description. And if you have any thoughts or tips you'd like to share, make sure to leave a comment. I always enjoy going through them. But that's it from me. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you here again in the next one.